All right. Always good to catch up. Plenty of time to do that after the service. If you could find your seats, that would be wonderful. Just a few things happening in church life. Just want to draw your attention to. All the blokes said, hey. (laughs) So what's happening next Saturday is that we have a bloke's big breakfast. Come on, somebody. That's going to be a great time for all the men of generations. And uh, we have a very special guest coming, Dr. Alan Meyer. Doctor. He is an amazing man of God and uh, just devoted a large portion of his life, about 20 years, to, to speaking into men and to really champion on men. And so we just thought he's such a great person to, to get along to this breakfast. And it's going to be a, a great time together for all the men of Generations Church to be inspired. And uh, this is going to be great for the men, but how many know that it's going to be great for the families, it's going to be great for everybody. When the men get better, everyone gets better. And so I just want to encourage that. So if if you have not registered yet, you're welcome to do that right now. And how you do that is there's a QR code on the front of your seat, hopefully, or right next to your seat, and you can register for that right now. And uh, just follow the links along to the Blokes Big Breakfast. And that is going to be a great time together. So next Saturday and a good opportunity to invite your friends as well. And so we need to know numbers for catering purposes. And hopefully we're going to live up to the name. There's going to be a bloke's big breakfast. Come on. Plenty of food, but great fellowship as well and a great time together. All right. All the young adults in the house. Hello to you. Especially. Hello. Hello. There's one over this side. Is there any other young adults around the house here? (laughs) One over here. Come on. Hey, for you guys tonight, you have a house party. And uh, this is happening at 5.30 tonight as a regular catch-ups that you guys have once a month. But tonight, you're actually not meeting in a house. You're meeting at Thai Orchid. Who loves Thai Orchid? It's at a restaurant. So it's really not a house party at all. It's a, what what is it? A Thai Orchid party. It's going to be great. The, po- the point is you're hanging out together and having a great time. So that's happening tonight at 5.30. You can talk to Lily or any of the Young Adults team uh, if you have any questions on that. All right. A few things, a few housekeeping things for you to, to think about. Uh, yesterday we had a great working bee here at the church. So can we just give it up for all those that came down and helped out around here? There were some painting jobs painting the spouts, the spouting out there that that the plumbers put in. That was great just to see them disappear with the colours. That was fantastic. But thank you to everyone that came down and was just a part of the Working Bee, uh, really looking after this facility. It is a great thing that we get to do. And so I want to encourage you as well, if you've never been to a Working Bee, come along. It's always a lot of fun, great food, great people, and we get things done. I think that's good. All right. Who loves coffee? Yee-hee. Just a few housekeeping things on our coffee as we continue to, I guess, uh, grow. Uh, One of the things that we want to do is make sure our coffee order run thing out there after the service is is flowing well. And so what we do, we know that we put the the names on the lids and and that's the process. But one of the things that's just going to help that process just a little bit better is once your order is made, they will put your coffee on the stand underneath the TV and it is available for you to pick up. Is that all right? Where we can, we will deliver. But of course we deliver. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't deliver. Um, we have delivered, but we don't always roster that as a position. And so people might be going, where is my coffee? And they're waiting for it to come out. If you could just be mindful of that, just go up and there's my name. Grab your coffee. Take it to a friend. You're welcome to do that as well. That's just a bit of housekeeping for you. Hope that's okay. It was good to see Sammy last week. Does anyone know? Remember Sammy? She was up here talking about Borneo and what she's been doing with her Bible college. And she's heading across to Borneo as a missions trip and just shared a little bit, little bit about what was happening. And uh, that was great. And so she's back up at college this week. But one of the things she shared about is the missions trip that she wants to go on. And uh, one of the things that we love to do is support uh, through our missions giving. And uh, just to let you know, we we're able to support her as part of the church and, and put $500 towards her going to Borneo. 
Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for everybody that gives and um, into the tithes and offerings because what we do is we take a portion of that and go straight to missions uh, because we believe in advancing the gospel that way. And uh, so guess what? We're a part of that. When she goes over there and uh, does what she does, we as a church, as supporters, maybe you've done that as well individually and personally, uh, but she's very appreciative of that and, and thankful for that. So good on you. <laughs> And we're going to receive our giving now as well. And uh, just to thank God for what He's doing in the life of our church. And I just love being a part of a church that is kingdom focused, that we're not just here for ourselves, but we're here for others. And as a way of um, when every time that you give into the tithes and offerings or given in that way, uh, we take a portion of that to go straight towards missions, as I said. And so I just want to thank you for uh, being a generous church, being a, a kingdom-focused church, and that's something that we can continue to do, isn't it? In this in this day and age, when it's we want to focus a lot on self and everything like that, let's always build God's house. Let's always build His kingdom. And as a result of building His kingdom, how many know He builds our house? As we trust Him, as we as we give into that. So, can we just pray together? Is that all right? Because what we can do in isolation is not a whole lot, but what we can do together is amazing. And so, Father God, we just thank you for every person that has given, is, is thinking about giving, God, what a privilege it is to give into your house. We thank you, God, that we're part of something bigger than just ourselves. This is your church and this is your kingdom. And uh, we pray, God, that you will take what has been given, multiply it, do what only you can do. And God, we thank you for just this opportunity today to be a part of uh, giving in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So on the screens, it's not there anymore, but there is ways that you can give. Um, obviously, you can do that online. That's the way most people give. But out there is a giving box just outside those double doors if you felt to give that way. All right. Just to let you know that this week, Connect Groups are on as well. So that's one thing that you might be a part of this week. Also to let you know uh, that we also have our Tuesday chapels and make rooms. They're our prayer times. They're fantastic. So Tuesday at 9 to 10, make room is on from 7 to 8.30. And these are great opportunities for us just to come together, to worship, to pray and seek God. How many know it's important that we take time to pray? And we're a church that believes in prayer as our priority. It's not our last response. And we want to be a church that, my, Jesus says, my house should be called a house of prayer. And so if you've never been to a prayer meeting, it might just be come along and be a part of it. Because God's moving and He loves it when we pray. He loves it when we just partner with Him in that. So I just encourage you to get along to a prayer meeting. Come on. Amen. All right, who was ready for the word today? Yeah. I'm going to invite Pastor Matthew Briggs to come up. Let's give him a round of applause. All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Al. Thank you, Ben. Trev, take a seat. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you that what a wonderful privilege it is just to be able to come to church, but to be involved in worship and all the things that happen on a Sunday. And Lord, we thank you for everyone that serves. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can open the Word of God. And Lord, when we do that, that's another opportunity to open up our hearts, to learn, to grow, and to hear from you. So, Lord, we pray that, that that's exactly what happens. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. So, <clears throat> we've been working our way through the book of Romans. And today we're up to Romans 9 and 10. And the title of my sermon today is The Centre of the Universe. And I lived in Tasmania for a while uh, in the early 90s. And there was a, a guy that I met who worked on the, the council with, with the plumbers. 
His name was Tom. And Tom was an interesting, frail little man, quiet. And while I was there, Tom died at the age of 62. Tom had never been to Hobart. The furthest Tom had ever been was to Batman's Bridge, which was 30 kilometres from Launceston. So in his whole 62 years, he never travelled more than 30 kilometres away from his home. So for Tom, Launceston was the centre of the universe because he'd never been anywhere else to experience anything else. So what is the centre of the universe for you? Sometimes I think when we're teenagers, we think that the universe revolves around us. <laughs> you may have experienced that. Um, I've heard it said years ago from this platform that Tatura is the centre of the universe. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Was it you, Al, that said that? <laughs> Probably, right. <clears throat> okay, so as we unpack today, we're going to find that there's another centre of the universe. Beside you, beside Tatura, beside Launceston. Okay, now... It's interesting, as you go through the Bible, there's some common words that really come up quite often. Besides and, I don't think um's in the Bible, which I'm glad about, but and and is and are and the, and all, beside all those, if we can put those up, thanks Lisa, the most common word used in the Bible is the word Lord. 7,830 times, and, and they vary different depending on the trans, translation that you're reading. Then God, then man. Then number four, interestingly enough, is Israel. 2,750 times. Jerusalem, which is down at number 17, is 806 times. So as we unpack today, we're going to focus on Israel. We're going to focus on Jerusalem. And we're going to talk about what actually is the centre of the universe. So when I opened up my Bibles to to Romans 9 and 10 to begin to read and think and pray about this message. All the headings that jumped out to me were Israel. Paul's anguish over Israel. God's sovereign choice. Israel's unbelief. And even into chapter 11, a remnant of Israel and all Israel will be saved. So today, that's going to be part of our focus. I'm going to give you a bit of a, a history about Israel, about Jerusalem, about why that's important. Sometimes we live here in Australia and we, we don't give a second thought to what happens over in the Middle East. But it's right throughout the Bible and, and I think we need to know about that. The Bible talks about that those that bless Israel will be blessed so you may have no um, knowledge about Israel whatsoever. So today I pray, just, just listen and, and hope we can all learn something as we, we do a bit of a um, run through history about Israel and Jerusalem. And then we're going to get to uh, a passage in chapter 10 that we're going to look at in the second part of the sermon today. So we've got a timeline that we want to put up there for you. So we're going to go through 7,000 years of history, now and into the future, into eternity and beyond, and we should be finished before 3 o'clock, so just, <laughs> I might have to speed it up a bit. All right, so at the start there, we've got God created the heavens and the earth. Um, from Adam to Abraham was about 2,000 years. And then about 1,000 BC, before Christ, King David conquered Jerusalem and he made it the capital of the Jewish kingdom. About 40 years after that, his son Solomon uh, built the temple in Jerusalem. But then between then and, and up to Jesus' time, there, was, there just seemed to always be conflict. Um, the Middle East, Israel, Jerusalem, it's like this simmering of tension and wars and conflict forever and ever. Um, 586 BC, the Babylonians occupied Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple and sent the Jews into exile. About 50 years after that, the Persian king Cyrus allowed the Jews to return 
and to rebuild the temple, which is all in the Old Testament. There was a Roman general, Pompey. He captured Jerusalem in 63 BC and Jerusalem was under the Roman rule right through Jesus' time here on earth. And Jesus was crucified around about uh, 30 AD. So it's all that on the chart up there. I want to take you to a, a map of Israel. We'll go back to that timeline shortly. But with this map of Israel, you think back to Jesus' time. You've got Israel right in the centre there. And it was a major trade route. Okay, So we're not talking about there's no planes, there's no internet, there's nothing like we have today. And if you go, looking at that, if you go to the left, you're straight into Africa. If you head up to the top and to the left, you're straight into Europe. And if you go to the right, you come down and you're straight into Asia. So Israel was in a very specific place. And, and that's why nations wanted to conquer it. That's why they wanted to land. They had access. They had um, resources. Um, that's why Israel seemed to always be in conflict. So if we go back to our timeline... We work our way through um, after Jesus went to the cross. He died, was resurrected, the early church. And you've got guys like um, the testimony of Peter there. You've got the stoning of Stephen. And then as we go through there, we get to 70 AD. Israel is dispersed once again. So God has this covenant relationship with his chosen people, Israel. And they walk away from that covenant. They walk away from that relationship. They get dispersed and then they, they cry out and they come back and there's this whole process that keeps going on throughout history. So in 70 AD they were dispersed. And then something happened in 1948. Well, before that, let's go back to World War I. You've got the Nazis. You've got Hitler. You've got... This demonic evil that is behind these sorts of men that want this power. And his aim during World War I was to set out and basically exterminate the Jews that were living throughout Europe. But a remnant of Jews survived, amen? Isn't it funny how for some reason God allows these things to happen? But there's always a remnant. And in 1948, Israel was made an independent state and the Jews began to come back. From then on, there was ongoing wars. And in, in, in 1967, during, uh, there was just this incredible turn of events during the Six-Day War that Jerusalem was restored as part of the capital of Israel at that time. So that's just some history about Israel from the beginning up to, to now, to these days. And it's always been conflict. I um, was watching a conference regarding Israel recently and they've just discovered just off the shores of Israel um, a gas deposit which is going to give them gas for the next 100 years. So you wonder why all these other countries uh, have got Israel in their sights. Uh, it's just amazing. The res they're one of the richest nations, if not the richest nation, as far as resources in the world today. And they're always going to be in the firing line. We, you know, the Bible talks about wars and rumours of wars. The Middle East, it's just a hot spot, and Israel's right in the centre of it. I've got a slide here of my, my mother-in-law. Now, I call her mum. So, mum was 82 years of age and one of her daughters felt to take her on a trip to Israel. She'd never been overseas in her life except when she flew to visit us in Tasmania. But apart from that, she'd never been overseas. 
At 82 years of age, she says, yes, I want to go to Israel. She'd always prayed for Israel. She'd always had you know, Israel on her heart. So at 82 years of age, she goes to Israel with her daughter. About a 24-hour flight to get there. She gets there. Everything is foreign. The language, the people, the places, the culture, the food, everything is foreign. And yet she makes this statement, I just feel like I'm at home. And there's a picture of her with this lovely lady with a machine gun (laughs) and this other guy. And she just spent some time there and and had some incredible experiences. And um, I think if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, maybe not right at the moment, (laughs) but it'd be an incredible experience. I've got a cousin, Paul Geerling, but some of you would know him. He, he went to Israel and I said, Paul, what, what was the most best part of the trip? He said he was in the Garden of Gethsemane with a number of pastors and they had communion together. And he said he will never, ever forget that moment ever in his entire life. So it's an incredible place. Let's go back to our time chart. Thanks, Lisa. So we are... Believe it or not, we're in the last days. On that chart there, it talks about the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Now, probably one of the most popular views about the rapture is that the church, at some point, a lot of people believe before the tribulation seven-year period begins, the church will be taken out. So rapture means to be taken out um, and the church won't have to go through any of the tribulation that happens in that time. Other people believe it could happen in the middle. And actually, I heard something recently, which is it's like a new theory about this, that in Revelation chapter 8, there's a scripture And this new theory is that men will be raptured into heaven before the women are. Has anyone ever heard that one? Because it says that when the seventh seal was open, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. (laughs) And then the women arrived. But I don't believe that one. I... If you do, you're probably not married. All right. (laughs) So the thing is about this whole rapture business is, you know, some people say, well, I believe it's then, I believe it's then, and what does it really matter as long as we're saved and going to heaven? Well, I think it does matter because just look at the events that's happened in the last few years when COVID hit. When COVID hit, it showed how quickly the world can change. It showed the power that governments have and the laws that they can impose on you and I. Even to the point where for me to drive one kilometre down the road and visit my boys and have tea with them was against the law. And... And if I did that, neighbours could ring the police, because that's what was happening, tell them that I was there and I shouldn't be there because I'm spreading the plague. So all these sorts of things, went, before COVID, was just unheard of. How can this happen here in Australia? could happen overseas. There's, there's a lot of people that live in countries where um, they don't have the freedom that we have here in Australia. It shows you just how things can change. There's a lot of things that have happened in the last few years and we are rapidly heading towards a cashless society. AI is increasing all these things that are happening. And there's places today where people already have a digital wallet but now they're putting it into all your information and now they're putting it into chips that can be implanted into your wrist. You just go to the supermarket, bloop, buy your 
Cadbury chocolate, and out you go. So these things are already in place in different parts of the world. And when you, you hear about all this stuff, it just highlights that this is all in Revelation. This is all going to head towards an antichrist, the one world government. So why does your view on the rapture matter? Well, the more and more I study this, the more and more I'm moving from that the church is taken out to that the actual rapture where, where the Christians are taken up to meet Jesus in the sky and his second coming is the one event. And whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, that the more I study this, the more I lean towards that view. The only difference is that if you hold a view, and you could be right, that the church is raptured and you're taken out and you don't have to go through any of this, if for some reason that is not correct and you do have to live through the tribulation, all of a sudden you're faced with something that you never thought would happen. Will you stand in your faith? And that's why I think it's good to study this sort of stuff. Pray about, you know, listen to different sides of it. Pray about, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? But through all this, whether you go through the tribulation or whether you don't, Will you stand for your faith? Revelation 13 talks about that when the Antichrist arises, that people will be forced to worship the image. And the image will speak. And you imagine we're not just talking about a a golden statue. We're talking about an an image that will be created and with AI you can see now how that image could speak. And also we're heading towards those things. It forced all people, great and small, rich and poor and free, to receive the mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. So they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person... Who has insight, calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. The number is 666. And you can see how that could be incorporated into a a number and into a chip. So if the church is raptured before tribulation, happy days, we're all in heaven. But if we have to go through tribulation, if you're faced with, do I deny Christ so that I can buy and sell and feed my children or do I stand for Christ and possibly have to be martyred see these are decisions that we may have to face in the future so that's why I think just to be aware we did a study on Revelation a few years back a lot of people are terrified about Revelation or it's too confusing or they just don't want to know about it But you're blessed if you study that book. And uh, I think there's people that live in nations these days around the world that are hunted down and killed for their faith. And we can be here in Australia and be so far removed from that. So the thought of actually having to to face any persecution at all can be so foreign to some of us. So the main thing is whatever that... you. Christians may face in the future, your faith needs to be solid as a rock. You need to know where you stand. You can't, you can't be swayed. You know, if it means denying my faith, forget it. That's the most important thing for me. That's the most important example as a, as a husband, as a father, to give to my family that your faith in Jesus Christ is the number one thing. That's more important than anything else in this world. Because the decisions that you make here and now affect your future and your eternity. Amen? All right. So as we go through that, see, even right now, there are drones loaded with weapons that Iran have sent. They've already gone over Iraq airspace. Some of them have been shot down. And they're heading toward Israel. And all this is because of... 
there was a consulate in Damascus earlier this month that was hit and some Irani officials were killed. And they're saying Israel are responsible for it. So right now, there's conflict in Israel that could get much worse, even in the next few hours. So it's, it's, it's simmering. It's a real hot spot. So why don't we just pray for Israel? You want to join with me now? Let's pray for Israel. Father, we thank you, Lord, that Israel, Jerusalem, the Middle East, that this nation, Lord, has a special place in your heart. Lord, those that bless and pray for Israel will be blessed. So, Lord, we just lift up Israel today. Lord, and we pray for the Christians that are there. We pray for the the Jewish people that are there. Lord, we pray that all people will come to know you, Jesus. But, Lord, through this tension and through these wars and these conflicts, Lord, we just pray that there would be a special hand of God of protection upon the nation of Israel because it's such a central part of, of all that you're doing in the past, now, and into the future. So, God, we just pray your blessing and your protection upon Israel, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, on this chart here, once Jesus does return, it's interesting because a lot of people think once Jesus comes back, we all go to heaven and that's it for eternity. But it talks about that Jesus will set up his earthly kingdom in Jerusalem and we will rule and reign with him for 1,000 years on this earth. So if global warming is bad now, what's it going to be like in 1,000 years? (laughs) Anyway, so that's what happens. That's the millennial reign that actually we rule and reign with Jesus on this earth for 1,000 years. So we've been taken up to meet with him at his second coming. We have our glorified bodies, all right? So we're going to keep going for another 1,000 years. Um, The dead in Christ will rise. At the end of that 1,000 years, there's another conflict because Satan is loosed from his pit and he gathers for a big war and then that's that's the big shebang right at the end and um, he goes into the lake of fire and uh, then... Another interesting thing occurs. Revelation 21. There's a new heaven and a new earth. And it talks about that there's a city called New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven like a bride prepared for her husband. And in that city... It describes in Revelation 21 that God will dwell amongst his people. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away and he was seated on the throne and said, I am making everything new. So when we talk about the center of the universe, we're talking about the history of Israel through to now, through to a thousand year reign, to even when this world passes away, the center of the universe is still going to be the new Jerusalem. So it's just an incredible thing. Uh, Can we put up that map of Australia, Lisa? This is the size of the center of, of the New Jerusalem. That's one city. So there's a new earth and there's a new capital city and the size of that one city on the new earth is almost the size of Australia. It is huge. But wait till you look at the, the next slide. It's a cube. So not only is it 1,500 miles or almost 2,400 kilometres wide, that way it's the same in height. So it's just, it's just massive, isn't it? It's, just, it's hard to imagine that. 
that you could get in an elevator and go up to your penthouse 2,400 kilometres high. Imagine the view. <laughs> hey? You'd be looking down the streets of gold and the, the reflection would just blow your mind. Anyway, streets of gold, no potholes. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. All right. So we've laid a bit of a foundation, and it, I'm so glad it didn't take till three o'clock. But that's some history of Israel, past, present, future, and into eternity. So with all that in mind, as we get to, we're going to go through Romans chapter 10. We're going to go through that very quickly, verse 8 through to chapter 15. And it's talking about, it's talking about the message of the gospel. And I think with all that in mind, it just highlights why this passage is so important in our lives here today. So let's read it from verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead... You will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Okay, it talks about our heart. Your heart is your, it's the inside of you. It's the mind, it's the will. It's the emotions. It's with your heart that you make a decision, that you believe. There was a man in our church. He came to church for a number of years with his wife and with his kids. And we had some conversations over those years. And he'd still never made that commitment to ask Jesus to come into his heart. And then one day we... Gave an altar call and he walks out to the front and I go to pray with him. I said, why now? And he said, it just feels right. Isn't that amazing? That you can sit in church all that time and still have not made a a commitment. And I think back to when I was a teenager. It was probably similar for me. I was struggling for a number of years because... The universe revolved around me and actually I had to get to a point where, no, it revolves around him. Before I made a commitment, that changed my life. So you've got to believe in your heart. And I know if God is a foreign thing to you, this whole thing of faith is foreign, sometimes you've got to hear it a number of times or go through some things in life that that causes it to click and to drop into place for you. But if you're here today, the first step is... If you have never given your life to the Lord, you've got to, and it takes a step of faith because you'll never understand everything, is you have to believe and determine that within your heart. The next thing is it talks about confess with your mouth. So once you believe, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he's died for your sin, that he died on the cross and he rose again. So it's about making that public confession. That what has happened in your heart, you want other people to know about. Because I, I, I talked to one person one day and, and their faith was very private and it was very personal. It was just between them and God. But that's not what the Bible says. Hey, we are to be his witnesses. We are to shine our light. So once you determine that within your heart and you confess and you make that public... Sure, you want to use wisdom, but you want to 
be able to be a witness and an example and, and to make a difference to the people around about you. Whether they accept or reject it is up to them. But that's what God has called each and every one of us to do. I've got a thing here. Calling depends on believing. Believing depends on hearing. Hearing depends on preaching. And preaching depends on being sent. It's funny that it talks about how lovely are the feet of those that bring good news. And the band, if you guys would like to come up, and we'll just wrap this up shortly. I was thinking about that. How lovely are the feet of those that carry the gospel? I was on a, a missions trip in East Timor uh, just before COVID hit. And we had a couple in our church that um, had been going over to Timor for years. And they built such an incredible um, rapport with the people there. And we spent some time in Dili, but then we went on an eight-hour trip to this little village because they wanted to go where most of the other missionaries wouldn't go. And we went out to this little village, and there was a blind man there. He had a family and he had a house. And we spent three or four days just concreting what was a dirt floor in his house. We had a team. We'd mix our own concrete by hand and we'd pour that. And we'd, we had a couple of guys that we'd just spend time with all the kids playing games. And each night, um, the lady that had organised the trip, she had the Jesus movie and she had it translated into their language. So we have a projector and put up a sheet and we're all sitting outside watching the Jesus movie over three three nights or whatever it was then at the end of that my job was to get up and give a preach the gospel and one of the local guys comes up to me and he says it's getting late the kids need to go to school tomorrow we have to end it now and I thought okay please just give me five minutes he said okay five minutes so I got up and in five minutes I just preached a simple gospel message on the back of them watching that movie. But it wasn't just about that. It was about the years of these, this couple reaching out to that community. It was about the practical of, of working and supplying their needs. And straight to the point, but God had been moving in their hearts. Every person that was there, I think there's 25 or 30 people, adults, kids, every one of them responded and accept Jesus into their hearts. And then all the kids that had to go to school, go to bed and get up that next morning for school, no one wanted to leave. And it was just this incredible experience. It was one of the, my favourite experiences that I've ever had in my entire life. And that just highlighted me that sometimes the feet of those... You've got to go somewhere to carry the gospel. And for some of you, if you ever get a chance to go on a missions trip or do something like that, incredible. But every one of us here, every day, you, you, you go to a job or you go into your school or you go to the club or to this sphere of people that you might have a sphere of people, a sphere of influence in a group of people in this community that no one else in this church knows. We all have that opportunity to share the gospel. And as you do that, the Bible says, how lovely are the feet of those that preach the good news. So today, this is all about us here understanding and knowing that we need to believe in our hearts, confess with our mouth, and then live it out. And then as we live that out, we pray that others will come to know the love of God the same way that we have. But today we're just going to, as we close off, we're going to give you the opportunity. If you don't know the Lord, if you've never committed your life to Him, or maybe you have, but you know you're not in a good place with the Lord, or you want to rededicate your life, I'm just going to ask you 
whether there's turmoil inside or you don't know, to take that step of faith and to respond today. With everything that happened in Sydney yesterday, you could just be going shopping. Who knows how long our life is on this earth. So let's all stand. We're just going to play a little song. If you need to respond today, if you're not sure, I'd just like you to ask yourself this question right now. Am I right with God? And if there's turmoil going on, you need to come out here. We'd love to pray with you. So if that's you today, as we sing this song, please, I'd like you to come to the altar. Sometimes God just turns up and amazing things happen in this spot. It can happen right where you are, but sometimes just taking that step forward, something incredible happens and opens up in your heart. So if that's you today, please come as we sing.